Hey everybody and welcome to the Atypical Life YouTube channel. My name is Josh and I'm sat here with Simon Fisher Becker. Very big hello. hello to you. Whoa. Very yes. big hello to you. You look, you look as if you're in the TARDIS. <laughs> I can see behind you. Oh, <laughs> special yeah. camera trickery just because where I'm sitting right now looks like a submarine basically. It doesn't look very appealing behind me. <laughs> And I can see I've got a wacky great big hole in my ego wall. Uh, oh, it's a great uh, ego wall, to, though. Yeah, I had to take a picture down, hmm. uh, and uh, the screw that I had in the wall came out. Oh, no. Well, that was okay. And it's gone into the carpet somewhere. I can't find it. But anyway, uh, hey ho, such is life. <laughs> I can see an awful lot of door in back there, which is great. Uh, well, there are various things. Uh, uh, yes, the the blue the door in there is um, a portrait done by a New Zealand artist, uh, Michael wow. Key. Uh, it's fantastic. And uh, just below me, shoulder, just over my shoulder here, you see a small picture door that yeah. actually came from last year's desk calendar. Really. So Dor Dorium Day, yeah, Dorium Day is the fourth of August. <laughs> I completely missed it this year. I was too busy doing other things, so I, I didn't. Just, if only I knew. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But, wow. But, uh, but it's an example of how being associated with one program, mm. uh, how extraordinary things come along. Oh, I mean, the idea that I'm part of somebody's calendar or, or diary is <laughs> seems very bizarre. But uh, but now it's happened so often that if I'm not included, I think, oh dear, what's happened? I can imagine. I imagine it's not exactly what you set out for when you started your acting career, or something you could have possibly imagined. You know, it's... no. You you ha you have your aspirations, and you have mm. your you know, you go out and you open the front door. And you think, well, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, and in reality, uh, there's no norm. Mm. Uh, and I, I would say, although I do hear the phrase sometimes, uh, actors in particular using the phrase career, I didn't think it would be good for my career. Mm. And um, for me, I, I have to laugh because there was initially, I have no control over the work I have. Other than I say yes or no when offered. Yeah. That's it. Otherwise, when you first start out, you're desperate to build a, a oh, I do apologise, a CV or a, or a resume, as our yeah. American friend said. And so, um, I mean, initially I was told nobody would take me serious and I probably wouldn't get much work until I was about 40. Really? Which, of course, filled me, yeah, which filled me with trepidation. Uh, so I just accepted everything that mm. anybody, whoever said yes to an application, mm. uh, I just said yes to. So as a result, I have a very broad CV now, and uh, I've um, got experience in almost the whole spectrum of the industry, really. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm, so I'm very busy. And... Complete opposite to what I was advised. I uh, initially, I would say, the first year after leaving college, mm. um, it was a bit difficult to just getting an interview, let alone anything else. But once I got my first audition and I got the job, uh, thereafter, uh, I sort of had a one in four hit. Yeah. So wow. that was quite so. So so every year I was doing something, uh, and then out of the blue, I got a call to audition for Doctor Who, mm. uh, and then from then, it's more producers and directors asking my availability, wow. rather than yeah, mm. which is such a change. Mm. I have to admit, and it it is a bit of an ego. Uh, I was going to use the phrase rub, but that might be taken the wrong way. But uh, um, but uh, uh, but it is nice to be know that people actually do want you and they call and ask for you. Of course. Uh, and of course, with modern technology now, there's no clambering on the tube or rushing to get a bus or d working out your route if you're going to drive to get to an audition. Uh, it's all done online with self-tapes. It's fantastic. So generally, 
Uh, again, I don't get many of those because normally Kim, my agent, just phones up and says, what do you think about? And then, and uh, then we give you, uh, nothing, you yeah. Wow. Uh, and, um, uh, and, that's, and that's really nice. And uh, what mm. I'm very pleased about, I was concerned initially during lockdown, I had no work at all. Mm. All my income streams sort of stopped. And there was this panic thinking, blimey. And also I was one of the very many thousands of people who didn't qualify for um, oh, any scheme. government support, oh. any, for any scheme whatsoever. So, wow. so that clenched the buttocks as well. So, <laughs> or the sphincter. Yeah. And uh, so you do, don't know what to do. And it did take me right back so when I first started out, there was this mm. terrible, desperate feeling of where's the next job coming from? Mm. Is another job going to come along? So, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that things have kick-started themselves again. Oh, thank but you. during lockdown, I found other things to do. I, oh. I got more and more uh, uh, audio work. Yes. Lovely. And uh, Tony, my husband, has a music room which acts as a professional studio which everybody so far has accepted it works for them so that's fantastic uh, and i've got on with writing projects so uh, i mean uh, 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 many of the fans know i've written two autobiographical books of anecdotes really mm. um uh, uh, called uh, my dalek has a puncture and my uh, my dalek has another puncture <laughs> yeah. yeah just to just to show my my uh, so there's my dalek had a puncture Ooh. and that's my dalek had another puncture <laughs> there you go and uh, and uh let zygons be zygons will be published soon Ooh. So, so we're in august it should be uh, there has been some delay with it partly mm. my fault uh uh but uh, hopefully it'll be available from end of september beginning of october just in time for christmas Get to it, guys. Everyone yeah. watching yeah. us. Yeah. But, but yes. Anyway, get... now, tell, now tell me about you, because uh, you just sort of contacted me and said yeah. you'd like to have a chat. So well, you're based in Liverpool, is that correct? That, that is absolutely right. I am a, I'm, I'm based in Waterloo, which is quite near Southport, if you know where that is. Yes, yes. Yes, so that's where I'm based. And over the course of lockdown, yeah. um, like you, I probably had a lot more time on my hands than I did previously. And I thought I'd give the YouTube thing a proper go. So I started off making like Doctor Who lore videos, like what happened in this obscure book in the 90s. And naturally that didn't get an awful lot of views. Why would it? But they're, um, they're very, very small bits of trivia. Um, but then I by chance sent an email to someone who made a Doctor Who film in the 90s because I wanted to get like a piece about them for one of those lore videos. And they ended up giving me like an hour interview. And just through that, I ended up um, asking more and more people and getting uh, different uh, people onto the channel. So now what, what I do right now is um, I'm an interview channel, really. I'm, I'm, I like to get actors on and hear about their experiences, what they think um, of the shows they've been in and how did they get to that point? You know, um, what went into that career, be that with creatives, actors, what, what have you. Yeah. Yes, and we all we all have a similar but very different route. Yeah. Because uh, uh, a lot of it is just sheer luck that you're mm. in the right place at the right time. Um, uh, uh, I was lucky, as I said, the first year mm. because before before becoming a professional actor, uh, I was in the civil service. Ooh. And uh, uh, you know a proper job uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, I uh, almost died in because mm. uh, of the it, to say it was boring is absolutely wrong. But mm -hmm. I just knew I didn't want to be there any longer than I had to be. Yeah, it wasn't for you. Uh, uh, it wasn't really for me. But like everything else, I enjoy what I do at any mm. time. So, so then that so I left there uh, because there was an opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, they were making civil servants uh, redundant. Mm. 
at the mm. time it wasn't called redundancy it was called something else but there but they just offered you a bag of money if you wanted to go really yeah and so uh, and today it would be called voluntary redundancy uh, and so with that bag of money i went and did a postgraduate uh, drama course mm. and then from there uh, it, it, i just went to the uh, Stage and Television Today was the Ooh. theatrical newspaper and uh, the back pages of about seven or eight pages, there were uh, advertising uh, for actors. Ooh. I think today, if it was going, it'd be about half a page if you were lucky. But mm. I used to, used to go through things and, um, and just write off things which I was suitable. Uh, and of course, it, it, it was all done with... Um, um, sending stamped addressed envelopes. Yeah. Ooh. Relic. None of them. None of them came back. None of them mm. came back. And it was a bit soul destroying. And then yeah. suddenly, I, I suddenly I got called. I got a phone call. As I recall. Mm. Thank you for sending in your CV. Could you come and have a chat tomorrow? Oh, <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, oh yes, it was. Um, it was a, a production of. Uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, and I was offered the Griffin. So, the, so that was a uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that's how it all started, uh, mm. and then, but then once a job is over, you're back to where you were. Oh, yeah. There's no job now. What happens? How am I going to pay the gas bill next month? You know, mm. uh, and then, but you keep on writing. You keep on writing, mm. uh, and then all sorts of uh, stipulations were put in place. Um, uh, in my day, you weren't allowed to work in the West End or work on in certain areas if you weren't a member of equity. Really? So, yeah, but fortunately, I had an agent, his name. He's still with us, bless him. He must be mm. at least two, 205 now. But his name is uh, Barry Stacey. Mm. And he, he helped, he did, he helped young actors by getting um, um, equity contracts yeah uh for for jobs uh, and then, you know most of them were very run of the mill nothing special but it gave me my accreditation as it were mm. uh, uh, to get into equity and then politics got involved mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh what's they called it they used to call it um i can't remember the phrase now but if you're not allowed to have a certain job unless you belong to a certain union, right? Uh, that, that that I can't remember what it was called now, it was so long ago. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that was scrapped. Oh, uh, and, and equity fumbled a bit at the beginning, so mm. so the people running it, so uh, equity itself went through a slight hiatus of not knowing what to do. Uh, mm. But of course, that opened the floodgates that anyone could just wake up one morning and say, "Oh, I'm going to be an actor today." <laughs> And um, uh, <laughs> a lot of them fall by the wayside because they soon realise that things aren't as uh, sweet and glorious. It's not all Hollywood. Uh, as, it's not all Hollywood. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, but to me and mm. to people of my era, to Absolutely. get your equity card uh, was a status symbol it, because mm. uh, you had to achieve a certain amount of work within um, two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the work was uh, uh, produced under equity contracts, which stipulated certain things. So there was a minimum fee, a mm -hmm. minimum wage, equity minimum wage, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, very curiously, nowadays, the government or in the last, what, five or ten years, they've introduced minimum wages where equity was there from the start. Yeah. Uh, so it's a minimum wage. And if a production was going to be closed, you were guaranteed two weeks' money. Oh, you know when you left. Mm. Very, very union yeah, so. like in a lot of other jobs. Fans. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, but it, yes, but you see, a lot of people get uptight if they hear the word mm. union. Yeah, of course. They think you're a communist and you know, all that sort of <laughs> sort of. But it didn't really apply. Really, yeah. equity for for equity for performance is really more of a, a governing body giving yeah. advice and very useful now. Those who've gone to equity for help and haven't got the help that they wanted will mm. be will be negative towards equity. Of course. But there are those like my good self who've 
gone to equity sometimes because there's been an issue and they have been able to help me. So mm -hmm. I'm very positive for it. And I do encourage any new yeah. uh, uh, recently graduated uh, drama performers to mm -hmm. um, to join equity because it's a useful cushion. Absolutely. I was about to ask uh, if you had any, um, you know, advice for people starting out in this uh, crazy, crazy industry, but it is. Well, the, the main advice is be prepared. Hmm. I mean, you, you've been to college and hopefully if the college are doing the job right, they will uh, provide you with experience uh, and above all, uh, particularly for actors, uh, there's an industry directory called Spotlight in the UK. Yeah. It's like the American IMDb. Every performer, every actor has registered it. And um, because everything initially, until you get to a certain status, is done through Spotlight. Mm. Casting directors will put, put messages up on Spotlight to say, this is what we're looking for. Agents will look at those notices and think, oh, who have I... Who have I got on my books who could fill those roles? Mm -hmm. And it's all done through Spotlight. So it's very, very important. And the other extremely important <clears throat> requirement is some sort of showreel. Oh, yeah. Or as the, or as the Americans say, a yeah, demo. <laughs> um, uh, and it is important. And yeah. for uh, colleges, will, will, should send you out with a showreel that mm -hmm. they've been able to produce at the college. Mm. Uh, and and you might think it's a bit naff at first one. Of course it will. Just and any casting, yeah, any cast director or producer will understand if you've only just started out. Yeah, uh, uh, your CV will be short, mm -hmm. but uh, the show will is important because it's really not what you do on it; it's how you look on a show, mm. how you look on screen, and that's what. Uh, that's what they look for, really. That's oh, absolutely. Um, I'm from a media background myself, so I, I've done college. I'm currently finishing up uni as a media student. And yes. the very first thing they did as one of my first units back in college, let alone anywhere else, was a showreel. Just make sure yeah. you get anything you can in there and update it. Yes, because, uh, I mean, I'm very lucky in that mm. my degree originally was in business administration. Mm. Business administration, and I specialised in the arts. Mm. Uh, because I sort of had this fantasy at some time that I, I, I would work in the arts in some form of capacity. Mm. Then when I joined the civil service, I thought, oh, I might, might get a job in the arts department. And re literally at that time, the arts department was part of the science department <laughs> and was a sort of a broom cupboard on the third floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now, but what is it now they call it? Uh, they call it culture and media. Mm. It'll have some Media big fancy forward. title. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, so I have an understanding in that sense of marketing mm. uh, and what you need to do administratively. So, yeah. uh, uh, so it's not such a, a thing, a, a problem for me. Um, and but for uh, recent graduates, the idea of suddenly having to deal with HMRC. Mm. And and uh, and other legal bodies uh, to yeah. get certain certain documents that you require. It can be overwhelming, but your college should have had a unit on it, in my opinion, because I completely agree. You 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 are being spat out, and you basically you are just a a one person uh, industry. Mm. Is really, you are promoting yourself. Uh, and they either want you or they don't and and that's the mindset you need to build also when you're doing auditions mm. uh, I used to get quite wound up because I'd say this this part is I fit it like a glove <laughs> and I go and I do an audition and I think oh that was good and then I didn't get the job and that used to think oh my god but then there were other times I thought oh this is going to be a waste of time uh, but I went and I get the job mm. There we are. You have, there's no, there's no, there's no real formula, mm. other than be prepared, and uh, and also sometimes with castings they say, can you prepare what we've sent you? And by prepare, they really mean learn it. Yeah. Uh, and you turn up and do your best, and as long as you're happy with what you did to, you then forget about it and move on. Mm. Uh, I mean, it used to be that you used to know if you got the job, you'd find out within three days. Mm. Uh, but sometimes 
you'd forget about it, think you hadn't got a job, and then three months later they'll say, yeah. oh, you remember you did... <laughs> By which time, of course, you've accepted another job. Well, of course, that on, on like, big scales as well. Like, I, I heard that, like, um, Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, when they were casting for Star Wars, didn't know for months. You know, they probably didn't know for nearly a year and after their auditions till they got their roles. So abs absolutely, it can be a bit of time in between. So just keep it in mind, I suppose. Yep, Absolutely. it's a it's a funny it's a funny industry, mm. uh, and uh, I don't know why certain things take so long, mm. uh, but uh, but there are various equations uh, that uh, you just have to accept, and in many ways, uh, uh, a number of my friends and contemporaries feel that we're quite badly treated it's mm. and they get they, they get uh, upset because they feel that they're being uh, what's the word uh, well they're not they're not being treated with respect there we are yeah it came, i mean when i first I, when i first got my theater jobs you know mm. i used to be one of maybe six people that they would interview mm. and the people i would see would be the director and the producer yeah, and you would and you were paid. I was paid seven pounds to go to a, yeah. to go to an audition that paid for my train fare, and I had a little bit of change left over. Huh. Uh, you'd sit and have a chat. Sometimes they would ask you to read something. Uh, if it's something like a Shakespearean project, then of course they will ask you to come along with a Shakespearean speech. Uh, but uh, if it's not not Shakespearean or technical in any way, they just have a chat. And what they're looking for, or what they used to be looking for, is that you're not a prat. Yes, yes, they want to know the personality. You know, they, 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 yeah, they just want to know that you'll fit in. Yeah. And and <laughs> and very often it would be just that. They, do they think, you know, mm. if, if, for example, they're looking for a husband or wife team, they they uh, they try and think oh well that person would probably be married to that person yeah <laughs> but uh, you don't know uh, so and that was it uh, mm. but then gradually this uh, casting director came in uh, and uh, he or she would call in 20 30 50 mm. people so automatically your chances are produced uh, uh, and uh, no money yeah. If there yeah. if there was a recall, you'd get a payment. If there was a recall, yeah. But uh, uh, but there we go. And again, mm. like everything else, you either get the job or not. Oh, absolutely. And with that, I suppose um, I, I must ask because this is going to be a point for a lot of people talking about this professionalism and making sure you have the right personality to want to be casted. I suppose how important do you think that is? Like presenting yourself and being. Um, what they're looking for, I suppose. How important yeah. do you reckon that is? I think, personally, I think it's very important mm. uh, because I also, in the past, in a different existence, I've also produced uh, projects and things, and I've had to go through the process of yeah. uh, being on the other side of uh, casting. And there is, you could tell by some people's attitudes, some uh, actors uh, I found particularly if they think they're not suitable yeah. for the role. And that comes on it. I, it, it. What comes to the door is somebody's, although they don't actually say it in words, you sense that they're thinking, well, this is going to be a waste of time. Why have you called me in? Uh, and the real reason they've been called in is mm -hmm. because uh, they've, uh, uh, they've been put up by their agent uh, or they've put themselves forward uh, sometimes, uh, but more importantly, we have seen some sort of showreel, so we know that they can do the job. Yeah, and it's just a question of auditioning and see if they're the right one or not. Uh, and you can sense that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, uh, I, I remember having a conversation with my mother. My mother was a nurse mm -hmm. uh, in the NHS, and she rose to the ranks of matron. And when she had to or interview new nurses uh, she was very strict I mean her attitude would definitely go across all HR rules of today yeah. but if a candidate turned up with the baby mm. to the interview she wouldn't interview them 
Wow. Because her viewpoint was if they can't arrange yeah. uh, ba baby care, you know, a babysitter for the interview, what are they mm. going to be like when they get the job? That's Likewise. It. Likewise. Because uh, my mother is very funny, she won't mind me saying this. Too. But if they turned up and all their stuff was in a in a tatty carrier bag, uh, she wouldn't necessarily dismiss them. But it would be if it was a choice between two or three other candidates, then the one with the carrier bag would be the first one let out the door. <laughs> of course, and that, yes, that is a there is that. Uh, I'm not going to call I mean, it prejudice, but there's his... something there, right? You know, I wouldn't no, call it... Yeah, I suppose, so. yeah, it's just an attitude. I mean, yeah. you that, I, I, for example, when it came for Dorian, for Doctor mm. Who, I will confess, uh, because what the script I got sent, it just said large blue man, mm. you know, right? And I know under no stretch of the imagination was I going to slap blue makeup on mm. and to uh, go on the underground. <laughs> to the to the uh, to the audition but i wore everything i wore was blue right shirt tie shirt tie blue jumper blue trousers blue socks everything was blue uh and it was remarked upon at the end of the audition yeah is it is it significant that you're wearing blue <laughs> and yeah there was it uh, uh and some actors like to go dressed up in some sort of outfit that they think resembles the character but conversely some car casting directors don't like that. So you, you, you can't gauge win, it. really. But you've got to gauge it yourself. Uh, it is an attitude, i.e. you turn up on time, if not early, you know, not too early. Yeah. You know, it's not that it's not the Harrod sale. So, but, you know, uh, you know, in theatre, you have to be in by what they call the half. Right. Which in fact, 30, which in fact is 35 minutes before cutting up. You know, so if you get into that attitude, it, 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 firstly, it does allow uh, you a bit of extra time should there be problems getting in. Yes, of you course. You know, with, tra with traffic or anything like that. Uh, and also it gets you, gives you time to settle down, make yourself comfortable, mm -hmm. um, and time to go through the lines if they've sent you any lines, or quite often in the past, used to turn up and they give you the lines <laughs> well, that's i can't think of anything worse personally like <laughs> but uh, uh but i'm laughing at it now because i've been through it yes of course uh, and uh, uh and it is very you think crikey how could you do that uh, mm. but once you're offered the job every bit of stress you had in getting the job disappears immediately Course celebration. Yes. Mm. But then the paranoia starts to kick in. You think, oh my God, they've offered me the job, but will I be able to do it? Will they like what I do? <laughs> Sounds but, uh, to me like a lot of acting is second guessing before getting the brilliance out there, you know? I, I, then, I did, you see, then you start getting a reputation. I mean, mm. you know, you know, and I will admit, uh, I can't. About five years in, I found I was I was turning up at or auditions, and amongst the people, and you got a, a, I would only be considered if there's F A T written in front of the character referenced. Uh, and there, but there were three or four others, hmm. and we became quite pally, hmm. uh, and and we were friendly rivals. And it got to the stage, it was, oh, which one of us is going to get it? Because generally speaking, it was one of us that got it. Yeah. The job. Um, uh, 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 so you do get, uh, so that actually helps in some sort of way. Mm. Uh, but uh, yes, turn up. Uh, and whatever you do, don't give any suggestion that you actually won't be available to do the job. There we are. Yeah. No. They don't give any suggestions. Or the, the, the reason is they've called you in because they've been told you are available. Mm. Right? Secondly, you don't want to say uh, that uh, you're not available because then they won't choose you at all. And you never know, the production dates might have to change to a date that you are actually available. There we are. So you just turn up, do as you're asked, have a chat, and don't be a prat. Mm. Very good advice. It's a, yeah. 
It sounds yeah, very simple, I, but you hear so much um, when I've spoke to directors, when I've spoke to writers, whoever else is on production, you hear about a lot of actors having attitude problems and like being divas and what some, have you. Yeah, some do. Uh, the diva aspect I have come across. Mm. And uh, and I, I there's part to be amused by it, uh, mm. another part to be annoyed about it, because then that tarnishes us all. Of course. But uh, what I do... <laughs> One thing I will thank some divas for is sometimes, particularly when you travel abroad, <laughs> they think you're going to demand certain things, so they offer it anyway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and I, I personally, it's not like as I've got a decent hotel uh, or, or a room to stay in at night, if it means staying overnight. Uh, uh, and as long as I'm uh, given good notice of what's required of me mm -hmm. i've got no problem i i now have uh, uh, personal issues and i just let everybody know up front and i have to i have to say uh, in the main the bbc in particular have no problem with anybody's issues as long as they know what they are okay the only time there might be a, is if they haven't been told Okay. So, so for example, I I have mobility issues now, and I mm -hmm. travel around on a mobility scooter. Mm -hmm. So my agent lets them know this, and uh, will they be able to accommodate? There's no problem because most uh, of the characters I get offered are probably sitting down anyway. The only issue is, is if they want me running. Right. <laughs> but, okay but but let them know you see of course, uh, yeah. some people will go oh no if they if they know they won't call me in and blah blah let them know hmm. let them know uh, and i'm i'm very lucky very very lucky um after doctor who i was automatically offered a part of a bariatric patient huh? bariatric patients are large people uh, and they're probably having some uh, something to tie their stomach so they won't mm. eat anything or so. Uh, in a in a series called Getting On, that starred Joe Brand mm. uh, uh, as a national uh, health nurse, and also Joanna Scanlon and Vicky Pepperdine. Ooh. And then after doing that, whatever I did, whatever I did, they liked, uh, and they just phoned up uh, one day and asked my agent if I was available to do something. They sent a script and they said, if Simon likes it, the, the role of Tony Pazakali is yes. his. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Anyway, did we, anyway uh, um, so I got this um, regular character in a series called Puppy Love. Yes. Uh, which, yes. Was, which was one of, the, one of the best jobs I ever did. Mm -hmm. uh, but they wrote the character around my mobility issues. So Tony wow. Pazakali for the series, was uh, caravan bound because he mm. had um, not claustrophobia. What's the other one? Agrophobia. Agrophobia. He was agrophobic. See, it was wonderful, and mm. the fact that they wrote that with my needs around uh, was very humbling. Mm. But and it added the pressure. Well, as they've done that for me, I'm a, I better do the job properly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Oh, there we go. Sorry. It's, it's very good to hear that the industry is getting more in the way of being accommodating, because uh, I don't think that would have happened. I mean, I mean, you, you were there uh, uh, 20 plus years ago. You can tell me this. I don't know if they would have done that for someone 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know, because 20 years ago, I wasn't, inverted commas, disabled. Of, of course. Uh, but funny enough, uh, I got a lot of work because I was large. Mm. Uh, most of my thin friends gave it up because they had no work and I used to joke with them because they say you really you, you really must uh, you really must lose the weight and I used to say but no I'd be broke <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like casting in a way then right uh, would, would, would you say yeah, that to that yeah it is a bit of typecasting and uh, the only thing if mm. I'm going to get on a soapbox mm -hmm. If there's a role and it's for a maths teacher, mm. I, I won't be considered at all. Mm. But if there's a, a role for a 
fat, large, rotund maths teacher, <sighs> then I'll be I'll be in on the list. So that's the that's the disappointing thing mm. is uh, and you know I'm just very grateful that Stephen Moffat uh, wanted a large actor for for Dorian. Mm. Otherwise, I I probably wouldn't be sitting talking to you now. So that's but, it. But do you accept it? Do you not accept it? At the end of the day, your mortgage has to be paid. That's there you the go. governing thing. I did, a, I, did, I did a little bit of, um, when, when I was in my first part of uni, I did a bit of an essay on typecasting and how um, it actually isn't as bad for some people as it is for others in the sense that it actually gets them more work than it would if it wasn't a thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I agree. They get more work, but I would also say mm. um, it, as a performer, you like to stretch yourself. Of course. And you like to do different things. And I'm very lucky also, conversely, mm. early on in my, in my working life, uh, one or two directors uh, took a gamble. Yes. They, they, they liked what I did in the audition. I totally wasn't what they were thinking of originally, mm. but they thought they'd give it a chance. And when I first started out, because of my size, I was generally considered the silly Billy, bumbling, comical character actor mm. is uh, what I was originally. But one or two directors gave me something more substantial, and probably, and then I found for myself that I was equally good at drama, oh, good well, and tra tragedy. So, and that that is good. So, discovering that that meant I was open to anything and everything, and that's why the character like Dorian was so perfect for me, because he could be very funny and very menacing at the same time. Yes, but, um, and it's great that you were given those opportunities. When I say yes, typecasting can be good for people. I obviously understand, but on the on the most part, it really isn't. But in, in when I yes. interviewed a bunch of people for that, and at least one person said, "This is the only reason I get work," and I think that's just an interesting thing to consider, obviously. But, yes, but uh, uh, but uh, there are lots of opportunities now. Mm. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful that um, students for their student yes. projects, recent graduates uh, who mm -hmm. are producing their first major work, will often contact me and ask. Look, we can't offer you much money, but blah, 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 blah. Mm. And uh, in the main, if they're offering me something that I've never done before, mm. or I'm probably unlikely to be offered in a bigger project, then I'd go for it. So, for example, I recently, I recently did, uh, filmed something. At the moment, it's got the working title of CA... Uh, brought in I think it's called oh. uh, I don't know what the whole thing is. Uh, but it's uh, the character I play is could be seen as a sort of bond villain okay the way the, the way the dialogue was written it could be so easily uh, fallen into a pastiche of James Bond it was it's not a James Bond project at all no. but uh, as I said to my agent look I'm never going to be offered seriously at the bond villain so um uh so i'm gonna go for it at least i can add it to my cv yeah uh, add it to my show reel is what i'm hoping mm -hmm. as so, much range as somebody is in, <laughs> so so if the production comes out as well as it promises mm -hmm. i can add it to my show reel. at least then i can show that i could be a bond villain type there we are Everyone should have the, the opportunity to show their range, you know, and I think I think that is wonderful, especially with more experimental first time films. A lot of people yes. will just go for this wouldn't happen in the mainstream. Let's do it here. And I like that. I really enjoy that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, know, you know, I could get a bit pompous about it. You know, I'm an artist. <laughs> I must be allowed. You know. no. I'm grateful for work. Mm -hmm. I like working and when I am working I know I have total job satisfaction uh, and sometimes it's harder because you've got mm -hmm. to do a bit more thinking about it other times it's very straightforward 
but sometimes you can fall into the trap that you think oh they're looking for very similar to what I did in some other project yeah uh, and and then they don't <laughs> Oh. Uh, but uh, no, it's nice to be at, especially um, now. Now we're getting through lockdown because mm. uh, basically the best part of well, what eighteen months or so, uh, mm -hmm. I had I had no what I would call proper filming work. I had during lockdown, I did get involved with lots of projects where my character was talking to somebody like mm. we are now. Oh. on zoom or skype so they they would film it yeah. like that well that's fine that's like good and i could slap a green screen behind me so they could put me anywhere yeah so i had a number of those projects but but the opportunity uh, recently just to get out of the house and drive 200 miles somewhere mm. to uh, to do a job and come back uh, it really did bring back how much uh not only did I enjoy it, but I actually need that. I need yeah. that. So, but, but there we go. Mm. I'd love, I'd love that we're getting back into routines again. I will say that. Um, I went yes. to my first convention um, again a couple of weeks back um, down in Devil's End, which was quite nice. And and just being able to go back out and do things I was doing so regularly two years ago is really really nice. Yes, uh, and I must admit, uh, uh, when not working, mm. uh, both me and both me and Tony are quite solitary mm. animals. We both got our own interests, which means, in my case, I'm encased in my little box here, my little mm -hmm. office, and Tony's in his music room. Um, and as much as I've enjoyed that, what I have missed is being with i mean chatting to people online excellent chatting to my family and my mother in particular excellent on with it I, at least i can see her and we can chat but it's not the same as being with them and and, I, and that registered more with me over the lockdown uh uh, uh plus i what i really missed was the spontaneous lunch Yes. You know, sometimes, particularly with filming, you, you go to bed thinking a car's going to pick you up at eight o'clock in the morning, only to get a phone call at midnight <laughs> to say, tomorrow's cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do it next week instead. And so then you think, oh, God. And so, and I would often phone up friends and say, oh, my day's gone pear shaped. Are you free for lunch? Mm. And of course, I've missed that terribly. Miss that, <clears throat> and and being with friends as well as family. But we'd be with friends where you could chew the card and just let yeah. your hair down. I think it. I think it is actually a human necessity. Hundred percent. That's what I've learned. That's that's what I've learned. Also, what I have really enjoyed is uh, having over thirty years of people telling me I don't have a proper job. <laughs> You know, actors don't know what it's like to have a real job, you know, blah, 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 blah. What I've really appreciated is people turning uh, uh, to the television. Yes. Uh, or the radio or anything. And who are they Who are they being entertained by? Actors, dancers, musicians, anyone in the arts field. So I would argue we are now an essential industry. Uh, I would and, go uh, as far as to say, outside of nurses and doctors... We've been, uh, we as an industry, I suppose, have been the most important aspect of lockdown, really, and keeping people safe. I think so, yes. anyway. So, so I'm, I'm very pleased I can stick two fingers up now. Yeah. Uh, some of the people, uh, some of the people who uh, criticise yeah. me. It's the you wouldn't, it's you wouldn't understand. Exactly. You wouldn't understand. I, uh, I, I remember my father-in-law sort of turned sort of saying, you know, you wouldn't understand it's not a proper job. So I said to him, okay, I'm going to say to you, you've got a very comfortable job. <laughs> you know, you've got a very comfortable <laughs> job and you're very happy in it. Now, things change. Every Monday, you have to interview for that job. And if you pass the interview, you can carry on working for the rest of the week. Oh. How will you feel then? I said, well, that's the actor's life. Mm. We have to audition. Uh, we have to audition for every single job, and uh, and if we get it, wonderful. And if we don't, there we go. 
I mean, as I've indicated, as you get as you get more of a reputation, I don't have to audition so much, but you still have to hope that somebody does contact you or there your you agent are. and say, are you free? There is a, and there are so many variables of how a project can get off the ground. For every film, the, the statistics at one point, for every film that you go and watch in the cinema, there are 20 that have actually been made, but don't get distribution. There we are, yeah. Yeah, and, and I know uh, between 1988 and 92, I did uh, six uh, comedy pilots for the BBC. Really? Mm, and if had any one of them taken off, I would have been a regular character. Mm. None of them were ever showed. None of them. Uh, we were paid. Yeah. Uh, we were paid and they didn't go any. Uh, and uh, I and over the years I've had a lot of work and I sort of joke I earned a good living appearing in nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> because, but that, that's another aspect that it doesn't dawn on you. Mm. It doesn't dawn on you that sort of thing. And um, I'd love to hear. And a there, bit can, more about there can there can be. There can be various reasons now. Mm. And of course, what's been what's been thrown into the mix more recently is if you do a project with a certain actor or actress who then gets a bad reputation yes. for something they, they did 30 years ago, then the instinct of the broadcasters is not to show it. There we are. So, the, so then poor you has only just started out two years ago uh, mm. uh, has an opportunity of being seen in something in which you could probably be, you know, launched off into the stratosphere, right? Yeah, and it, it could, you know, that's it, you know. But it happens all the time. Mm. I mean, I'm of the era that I quote people like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Uh, yeah. Who, when you read their when you read their autobiographies, Richard Burton does say that his best stuff, his best film work, ended up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. So, so that's the other. That's the other thing I say to young actors is, unless you do live stage work, you have no real control over your product. There we are. Yeah. I was. I when, would you know, once once you've got that mindset, once you've got your mindset, it's okay. But it did. I will take it. Took me a long time because, mm. of course, I was so keen. I was so keen to get stuff. Uh, on a uh, you know to be sent a copy of something you've done so you could add yes. it to your showreel, but uh, um, that's, things change. The industry changes all the time. Mm. Uh, it's uh, one of my favourite things about when I do the conventions is being in the green room with yes. other actors who are ten or twenty years older than me, um, and them telling their stories. And of course, I identify with everything because what they're saying happened to them happened to me. Yes, of course. <laughs> and then speaking to younger actors, they said, "Oh, well, that's happened to me too." And so, so we we get a, a camaraderie because we can identify with certain situations. But what it highlights is that in some cases, nothing has changed at all. Oh, absolutely. I must ask very quickly then, because I had no idea you've been in so many um, uh, pilots that hadn't made it. As an actor, do, do, do you get a little bit of, uh, when, you, when you hear that something isn't being made, like, you, you know, you've worked on something for quite an amount of time, maybe you believe in the material and then you hear that it's not being made. How do you deal with that, you know? Uh, well, as I say, on the one side, I got paid. Yeah. So, and, and reasonably well, you know, uh, you know, for actors starting out, they often complain about the money they earn. <laughs> But for a day's work, they earn a lot more than most people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so for what I do, I was paid well. I was able to pay for the mortgage, you know, mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. But on a professional basis, the frustration was not being able to use what you've done to help promote you yes. uh, to get other work in the future. And sometimes... You know, you could be doing projects that take the best part of a year. So that's effectively another year gone. OK, mm -hmm. you've you've got the roof over your head and you've had had a meal. But then, oh, God, it is frustrating. Yeah. 
mm. uh, just frustrated. And also, uh, the other frustration is not having been able to see what the finished product was. Yes. Again, I can only because yes. you hear so much about mov movies that get finished, and then yeah. and then you don't get to even they don't make it to film festivals, let's say, or maybe they make it to one screening in a film festival and they go. Yeah, I can only imagine as an actor, you know, you want it for something, you want it to show your family, you want it to show perspective. Oh. Well, um, another example, I I, I was uh, uh, offered the role of. The fat friar of Hufflepuff House in Harry Potter. Yes, uh, and uh, that whole process was bizarre. Mm. Um, and there were four interviews in the end. Mm. Really? Uh, uh, yeah, four. There were three because there were twenty of us originally. Yeah, we got whittled down to thirteen, and then down to seven, and then the last three. Uh, so there's a, and we did. We were. The main ghosts were contracted to the first four films, and we did a lot of work in a five-week period. Uh, and then when it came to the um, premiere of The Philosopher's Stone, mm -hmm. uh, we found we, we were cut out. I mean, uh, Rick Mayle, who was yes. pleased, the poltergeist got cut out altogether. But at, at least I got to cling on mm -hmm. for, a, for a few seconds at the sorting ceremony. Uh, and um, I joke now that uh, my name in the credits is on screen longer than I am. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was soul destroying. I must admit, of course, soul destroying. Of and I, I will say, I had a bit of a weep in the car on the way home yeah. because because Harry Potter was this big thing to be associated yes. with, and we had so much publicity beforehand that although I wasn't. Uh, no stretch of the magic was I'm going to say it was going to make me a superstar, mm -hmm. but I did think at the time that it would elevate my status. Yeah, of course. And so that was so that was so so frustrating. Uh, but what I decided from that point was that my acting was going to be my profitable hobby. Yes. So I found other works to do, and when acting came along, I did it. And funny enough, <laughs> with that mindset, for about two years. Uh, my hit rate rose. I got about yeah. one in two jobs because I just had this. Well, I'll do this if I get it. I get it. If I don't, doesn't matter. Yeah, breaks so her off, but, kind of, you know. That's right. And then, of course, Doctor Who came along ten mm. years later. Anyway, <laughs> no conventions were interested in me before, mm. uh, before Doctor Who. But then Doctor Who, and then of course through Doctor Who, Harry Potter fans spotted me. You know, in, in yeah. the sense that they were, well, who is this guy? Oh, he was in Harry Potter. And what is absolutely amazing is it uh, doesn't matter whether your role is large or small. It's just the fact you're associated with Harry Potter. Yeah. And you're, and you're in. Most of my fan mail from abroad is for Harry Potter. Mm. You must uh, you must come down to a place called Ormskirk. It's quite near Southport. Uh, they've got a Harry Potter themed cafe down there that I actually work right. at at the moment called uh, Mandrake's Wizarding World right. themed, you know? I've... Mandrake's, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Oh, well, I must do. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I can't remember how this stemmed. Oh, it was the frustrations, yeah. wasn't it? You were yes, asking. of course. The frustrations of not um, getting to see your work. And I suppose, I guess, with yeah. something like that. So I heard about that with Rick Mayall. I'm thinking, Rick Mayall's massive. Why, what, uh, did, did he not get told yes. beforehand? Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? I don't, it's I, for I, not a you, dialogue. I, I, we did loads of stuff because at mm. the time of filming, um, John Cleese was nearly yes. head to Nick. <clears throat> but at the same time, he was doing his cue in James Bond. Yes, yeah. And at that time, Bond took priority over Potter. Yeah, of course. So the reason the reason we were around for five weeks or so is because we were hanging around waiting for him. <laughs> but in yeah. between, in between us, some of us got to do some uh, improvisational uh, sketches with Rick Mail. Oh my goodness! What was that like? Absolute masterclass, mm -hmm. really, and absolute delightful chap. Mm. There was no pomposity or thing about him, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, let's get, let's get, let's get, let's, get, let's try this, that, and the other. And so we practiced a few things. And then when they went to film it, he did completely opposite. Oh. 
Love so <laughs> we were left there. So again, I'd love to see what mm. we've done. Yeah. Just uh, one, just to show I did work with Rick Mail. Mm. Uh, uh, and, uh, but two, I just think, I think the fans deserve, deserve oh, of course. it, really. Because if, uh, uh, see. if you read the book, the first book, um, Philosopher's Stone, Peeves is so like Rick Mayhall anyway. You, you know, you, it's perfect translation to screen on paper, you know? Yes. Absolutely. And then there's the sequence in the book where they, I think it's, I think it's in the first book where they actually have like a party of all the ghosts. I think it's in the first yes. one. Yes, and that's the second book. It's the second yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah. The Death Day Party. But yes, we actually filmed the Death Day Party. Really? <clears throat> or we filmed stuff that we were told was going to be in the Death Day Party. Yeah. Yes. I have to sort of say, but it's all such a blur now. It's what it's twenty-one years ago. Of course. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, but um, it was absolute fun to do. Yeah, I was very nervous, although I didn't get to meet many of the big names because mm. uh, we were a sort of separate unit. Of course, I did. I did get to be in the same airspace as um, as some of them. Uh, and I remember one afternoon I was having my makeup taken off. Mm. Uh, and um, Zoe Wanamaker came over to me. Really? With a, with a bundle of books, just plopped them on the table. And um, and uh, she said, these are for you. Oh, no, apparently these are for you, plonk. Mm-hmm. Oh, I said, what, oh, what am I supposed to do with these? And she said, uh, I think you're supposed to sign them. <laughs> I said, what, what, me, sign them? <laughs> this is strange. She yeah. said, well, you are the fat friar. And I sort of looked up at myself in the mirror, and mm. behind me there was Alan Rickman, who gave a wink and put his thumb up. Oh, like wow. That was my sole conversation with Alan Rickman, I'm sorry to say, but that was it. But that's well in my memory box. Wow. And and so that was very, that was very surreal. Mm. Um and um, our costumes were very heavy. Oh, of course. Uh, and so they they travel. We got to travel around uh, on golfing buggies. Mm. And because of my because of my size, of course, I was on the ferry back. It was like the buggies mm. you get at airports. Right. And uh, so I I saw. So it was, <laughs> it was a bit like uh, two thousand and one. The world will just disappear. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but there was a slight. We slowed down for something or other, and to my left, there was Richard Harris. Yes, there was Richard Harris uh, as Dumbledore, and I just and of course my brain is saying, "Oh my God, that's Richard Harris," uh, uh, and I and I said, uh, "Hello there," and he went, "Morning," <laughs> <laughs> and then we zoomed away again, and again yeah. that was my sole conversation with Richard Harris, mm. but. Uh, it would have been nice to have been in a had to have had an opportunity if if it you know just to sort of spend a little more time with them. Mm. I think the fans uh, I, agree. I, I really yeah. do. I mean, I'd be very fortunate that I've done stage work with some of the good and the great, mm. uh, and there were opportunities just then to sort of get to meet them properly. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I again, I've been lucky. Uh, um, uh, I was in a Christmas special of a series called Vicious mm. with Ian McKellen and Derek Ooh. Jacoby yes. and, Fran- and Francis de la Tour. It was, uh, and Marcia Warren, the entire cast were utterly, utterly delightful. Uh, and we, we filmed in, in front of a live audience as well. So I can say <laughs> I've worked with the but, uh, but there is an example of something very bizarre. Mm. I was called in to, uh, to do the job. We did the job. But as soon as I finished my bit, mm. I was then directed to the my dressing room and said, oh, there's a car waiting for, to take you back home. Wow. And I said, oh, I said, oh, is there not a uh, end of show party or anything? And uh, I was I was so... Uh, oh, I don't know. I, all I've been told is uh, you, you can't keep the car waiting. Uh-huh. So I left. So I left. And I really regret that. Mm. 
Wow. Because it would have been lovely to have had a proper chair. I mean, uh, Derek Jacobi was the first. No, Marcia Warren was the first. I passed her walking to the set, and uh, she said, "And she said, she said, I'm so pleased to meet you. Oh. I'd never met, I'd never met her in my life. Uh, I'd only seen her on stage work, and of course on telly. So uh, there's a, and then I turned the corner, and there's Derek Jacobi sitting on the sofa, which is part of the main set of this. Yeah, thing. and of course, what? I mean, he got up very slowly. Kind of, he put his hand out, and, and he said, and he just said, "Hello, uh, I'm Derek." Oh, very nice. oh yeah. And then right from behind me, uh, there was, and I am you. <laughs> I would have, so, uh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, and, of course, and then I just found myself saying, oh, well, I'm Simon and I'm the voice behind the door. Because <laughs> my my bit was being heard behind the door yeah. uh, with Francis de la Tour. And, uh, and then the uh, the director was Ed By, and he said, uh, uh, yes, hello, so I can introduce you to your door. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to the and we opened it and as we opened it there was Francis de la Tour mm. who uh, uh, for two I have to say um, utterly delightful mm. uh, she could see I was a bit frail on my pins and she mothered me oh. <laughs> and she made sure that I had a proper chair to sit on and things like that uh, and, I, and, and I just found myself I just felt, found myself saying no, 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 this isn't right. It's me who should be, uh, you know, <laughs> carrying to you. And, yeah. you know, and, and she, she said, nonsense, she said, nonsense. Oh. Uh, and they were all perfect examples of people who you could imagine be very devious and, in fact, have such a huge portfolio of work. You, you would understand it. Utterly delightful, no nonsense, down to earth. <laughs> and uh, I remember coming back because uh, 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 we had a rehearsal that was the rehearsal day then on the day of the filming um, Ian McKellen was very concerned uh, that I managed to negotiate the giant electric cables mm. Mm. and it's because, and, uh, absolutely divine. and again I just so wish I had a uh, had an opportunity to have had a proper conversation, or even just be in the green room with them and, of and listen to their stories. Uh, but there we go. That's a lovely's mm. life. Again, there's a difference between knowing someone in a professional sense and knowing them after the job is done. I can imagine, but there's not a lot of time to go. Yeah. I love you in this. Yeah. Oh, oh no. I, I... <laughs> It, I've I've developed a, 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 a not a skill, but I've developed a method of mentioning something that someone was in, yeah, rather than actually saying, "Oh, I loved you with this," you know, <laughs> just just happen to mention it. Uh, uh, but um, and of course, meeting the Doctor Who actors who I watched as a child, mm. Colin Spool, Fraser Hines. Oh, uh, it was. Uh, it's um, absolutely uh, unbelievable, mm. unbelievable. Oh yeah. That and so this this is when I say to drama students, you know, is you never know, you're an audition away from something rather special happening. Agreed. And of course, for me, what I didn't realise was the spin-offs of Doctor Who. Yeah. Was the sci the sci-fi convention. And then from the sci-fi conventions or at these conventions, you get to do what they call panels. And then yeah. from that, from that, I was able to develop a, uh, a one-man show. And uh, I was lucky that uh, Dan Grubb from Fantastic Books Publishing really? happened, to be in the, happened to be in the audience one day. And he says, you have to put this in book form. And so that's, that's, what, the, my, that's what That's my where the books came to. from. That's where the books came from. So thank you, Dan, for turning up that night. I mean, it was just extraordinary. I must very <laughs> quickly ask, Ben, uh, this is only a, a quick thing. Obviously, they're called yes. Daleks, right? Uh, well, yeah. well, we got the name Dalek in the title. Did you have to talk to the BBC about that first or anything like that? Well, uh, I did. I tried to talk to various people and mm. I got no real response. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, uh, and somebody said to me, just go ahead with it. If they really upset, they'll contact you. Yeah. So that's what I've done. And I'm sure there must be because the publishers would have checked and double checked. Of course, checked of course. And triple checked because they don't want to get into the realms of litigation or anything. So in that sense, I was concerned at first. Um, uh, but uh, I, I recommend if you want to know how those titles came up, that you read the first book. Here we are. Uh, great little preview for you. Read it. Uh, a little tweak there. Little tweak. Uh, Read but, the first book. Uh, yes, but, uh, but and then from that, of course, I've got people writing to me and asking me questions. Because the nature of my one band play is that I sort of tell my story yeah. with, with other anecdotes, you see. And afterwards at the bar, a lot of the audience would stay behind and say, and say things like, you know, when you said <laughs> dot, dot, dot. That reminded me. And then they start going on about a similar story that they had. And then <clears throat> um, a lot of people write to me and uh, they uh, and some of them ask the same question. Hmm. And I thought, well, I can't hunt them all uh, individually. So that's when I started doing my vlogs. Yes. So I got myself a, a YouTube channel and hmm. I started doing the vlogs uh, and... Um, and that's been a, a blessing in disguise. Uh, having done my vlogs, then, you know, speed forward. Um, uh, I was invited to be a, uh, uh, I can't think of what you, an occasional panelist uh, yeah, on a yeah. show called The Legend That's the Travelling TARDIS that is based in Florida. <clears throat> and so uh, there's that. Uh, I then was invited as a guest on a show called the No Name Trivia Show, which is based in Australia. Uh, mm. Long story short there, one of the co-hosts for that uh, no longer does it because he's got other commitments. So I was asked by the main host if I would join as a co-host. Wow. So I'm now a co-host of that. And I also contribute every week with a section called Simon Says. Oh, uh, right. And uh, the no name trivia show says it's governed by a letter of the week mm. or a number. So recently we had the letter V. So my Simon says uh, just talks briefly about uh, two or three things that start with the letter V. Mm. And I try and find collective nouns beginning with the letter V, which was a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then from that, the uh, ledger to the Travelling TARDIS noticed the Simon Says vlogs and asked if I would do one for them. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I now do Simon Says sci-fi. Oh. So uh, for them, and they and they're on a YouTube channel now. So uh, it's so it's all developed from there. And all of this, by the <laughs> way, I will be putting in yes. the description of this video but, that you are all watching right now. So Simon's channel will be the all your affiliated channels. We can we can sort that out at the end. Um, yes, absolutely. And, 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 and also, there's my own personal my own personal website which has the links to them all as well. Fantastic. So that's um, that's fisherbecker.info. So uh, so and it's fisherbecker without the hyphen. Oh, great stuff. <coughs> Yeah, so it's just Fisherbecker, one word, dot, info. Mm -hmm. It's because technology sometimes doesn't accept the hyphen. Oh, I've seen, yes. yes. But um, I've, I've, uh, I'm very impressed with this. I've kind of got a whole owl vault directly going on to Doctor Who. I don't know how I've done yeah. this, but <laughs> I've managed it. High five to yeah. me. Um, I'd, lo I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, obviously you said you auditioned for the role, so there was no, uh, Moffat didn't write this character with you in mind, I'd imagine then. It was no, up, up, until, up until Doctor Who, I had to audition from everything, whether mm. it was for a half day in a corporate video or a three month tour in a play, absolutely mm. everything. <coughs> me. And then this, I think it was what, 2010, 2011 sort of time. So it would be December 2009. I got the call from my agent. Again, the circumstances of which you can find in my first book. Ooh. And uh, uh, basically, it was a call, it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, I got an audition for Doctor Who. And I remember saying to myself, I really want this. 
I really want this. Um, and I had to go the following day. Uh, and it was a little tiny room in a church off of Tottenham Court Road in London. Really? Yes. Uh, and I met Andy Pryor and his assistant. Yeah. And basically, I got to read. I got to read the lines. Mm -hmm. Well, deliver them. Uh, I was then asked if I could deliver them in two other ways. And I was then asked if I could flirt with uh, with his assistant. Oh. So I did that. They all burst out laughing and said, "Thank you." In total, if it was ten minutes, that was that was too long in my estimation it was probably less it was probably between five and eight minutes and that was it wow uh, but but uh, on my way out i had a glance at who else they were seeing so I, anyway so i saw this list and the other guys are very capable and mm. very very good actors and i left thinking although i felt i did a good audition they were uh the people I had to beat. Right. Uh, I was hoping for a recall, but to my surprise, I just got this call. From, I got this call from Kim, my agent, mm. and she said, "Can I speak to the large blue intergalactic <laughs> black marketeer <laughs> from Doctor Who?" So that's how that's how I learned I got the role. Oh my days! Uh, uh, and that was it. And originally, and initially, it was just the. Uh, Dorum with uh, Dr. Song in the yes. Pandoric Opens, and that was it. So although as a Doctor Who fan, I was cock a hoop mm. to be in it, um, uh, I was disappointed it was just this one scene in one episode. Mm. But then, exactly a year later, I was called back and uh, to do A Good Man Goes to Rule, uh, to Goes to War, and then uh, I found Matt Smith welcomed me with open arms and gave me a big oh. hug uh, and uh, and saying something along the lines of, I knew you'd be back. Uh, and the child inside me was going, oh, my God, the doctor is hugging me. <laughs> oh, it's so, it was, inter so interesting it was, in all of us. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so there was a so then we did the we filmed all that uh, mm. and then uh, we did that and about a month later my agent called me again and she said well I don't know what you're doing but they want you back <laughs> and uh, and I thought well thanks for the confidence build there <laughs> my agent yeah uh, and wow. of course in the storyline Dorian has a debt yes and of course at the end of Good Man Goes to War Dorian loses his head. Mm -hmm. So that's what I thought. Oh, well, that's the end of Dorum. So I initially thought it was going to be um, a backstory, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. It was the wonderful, wonderful wedding of River Song, where Dorian ends up with his head in a box. <laughs> now, how was that to play, I must ask? Just um, being a head in a was, box. <clears throat> it was very surreal, but it was an opportunity to work with Matt Smith, and it was three days filming, mm -hmm. and he was utterly, utterly delightful, kind, respectful, uh, even to the extent that when they did the reverses and people see the doctor's back and sh shoulders, that is Matt Smith. Yeah. Wow. You know, because in the past I've done projects where the lead, when it comes to reverse, so you have a stand-in. Uh, mm. But no, he, he was great. He was great. Mm. And he... <laughs> and... Uh, our trailers, my trailer was quite high, so when he walked past, yeah, uh, uh, because my trailer had like a shutter as a wall, mm -hmm. you know, shutter, so it's up, so people could just look in, it was like being in a zoo, people <laughs> could look, people could just look in, and he'd walk past, and all I would mm -hmm. see is his head, the cat, the captive actors, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, and uh, and he'd come and he'd lean, he'd then lean. We go morning, Sai. It's like, how are you today? And of course, I hate being called Sai normally, mm. but this is Matt Smith and the Doctor, so I yeah. had to let it pass. <laughs> but it was it was a wonderful time, mm. uh, tarnished, tarnished only uh, uh, the passing of Elizabeth Sladen. It, it was course. that weekend. Wow. Yeah, and uh, so, but it was a wonderful time. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And I can I can definitely say that having appeared in Doctor Who, 
uh, mm. it changed my life considerably. Only to put this in personally, because um, the 11th Doctor's era, just, just growing up was my favourite era. Absolutely was, and so was that season. And this, I hope this doesn't age any, any, anything you tell me, but I was 12 when, when that yeah. episode came out and I was watching it. And yeah. I have to say, Good Man Goes to War at that time was probably one of my favourite episodes. I, you know? I, still, yeah, I, still, I still say that Series 6... Hmm. was an e excellent series it was the series that was also criticized because hmm. a lot of people complained they didn't understand it and so when people used to say that to me <laughs> uh, at conventions i used to say well ask your six-year-old daughter she understands there you go that's it i think i feel like it, a lot of that era is down to adults didn't get it but kids loved it you know and the whole on the river song, the wedding of river song, how it all got uh, put 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 together, I think is a work of genius, really. Mm. And uh, I get very upset when I hear people criticise uh, Stephen Moffat's writing mm. because for me, Dorian, he couldn't have put together a better. I couldn't have written it better for myself. Yeah, it, it was excellent, excellent. So mm. I but, feel uh, like. This is only my personal view. I feel like a lot of people have gone back. Certainly, if you looked online in 2015 and, and 2014, you'd hear a lot of hatred for Steve Moffat. I feel like now you don't know how good something is until it's gone. So I feel like a lot of people feel that his writing really was good now. I feel, I feel like that opinion's been put on its head. Maybe that's to do with their dislike for the current era. I don't know. But I, I feel like a lot of people have changed their mind on Stephen Moffat in the past few years. I, yeah, but also, there's lots of people who get on a bandwagon. Uh, there's, yeah. there's also an awful lot of people who like to be contentious. Yes. Uh, uh, just to be contentious, because they, they feed off of the response. Yeah. Really, uh, uh, and they, it's a, what would you call it? I don't, emo, they need the emotional response of people mm. responding to them. And so they deliberately poke. And uh, It's contrarianism, uh, isn't it? I sometimes can be accused of being an enjant provocateur, <laughs> but uh, sometimes I will admit I do it just to stimulate a conversation. Like now, we're having a decent conversation, aren't we? Mm, of course. What I, what I do, uh, but what I really loathe is the idea that we can't have a conversation and have different viewpoints on something without there being fisticuffs. There we are. Uh, 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 whereas I think what is needed is more... Uh, oh, Discussion rather Heath. than discourse, I'd say. Yeah, Edward Heath, who I had no uh, dislike for or mm. uh, whatever, uh, one thing he, uh, he used to say, uh, jaw jaw instead of war war there we and are. i think i think that's quite appropriate in today's uh, history we oh what's going on hundred percent yeah so no and i do i do as if you haven't realized i could talk for the nation <laughs> uh, um. <laughs> which is good but it's uh, great for this i must say um but when i say this like i recently did a, a big probably about two hour expo at like interviewing m multiple people about what they think of the current era of Doctor Who. And like one of the bigger topics of that is a, it feels a lot like people just like to hate whatever's in front of them because we got the same during the moth at time. You know, you know, when series six first came out, I wouldn't know I wasn't really looking online, but apparently the online reception at the time wasn't fantastic. I know it wasn't for series seven, etc. And I feel like it's been the same for about 10 years now. I think that is just a side effects of the internet really you know yes if they're watching it via the internet then they will miss a lot yes of what you get i don't know i i like jodie whittaker mm -hmm. uh i i love uh peter capaldi mm -hmm. uh i don't know the production values of doctor who in the 60s yeah and the 70s even uh, were, were quite Poor by today's standards, but that's because the concept of the show uh, 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 hadn't caught up with the technology. There we are. Yeah. Uh, but I would argue the storylines were much better than mm. some of the modern than some of the modern storylines, because uh, uh, some of the modern storylines rely so much on special effects. Yes. Yeah. So that that would be my only comment. 
Hmm. Uh, I'm a fan of Doctor Who. I knew I was a I always said I was a follower of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we went to film A Good Man Goes to War, mm -hmm. uh, we filmed the sort of battle scene in a, a, an aircraft hangar really? in Wales. In mm -hmm. Wales, And when we got in, you could see the TARDIS. Mm. And it was lit from above. And I, I felt myself taking an intake of breath and going towards it with my hand out and, wa and wanted to touch it. And it was at that point that I knew I was a fan rather than Ooh. just a follower. I would be exactly I, the same. <laughs> the, I'm old enough to remember a police box. Right, yes, right. of course. And uh, between my house and South Rice Tube Station, as it was, there was a police box, and I was convinced it was the doctor. And I was, and I was very. And then one day, the uh, the, the police box was taken away, and my grandfather said, "Oh, the doctor must be off on his travels." And I was so disappointed, so disappointed as a child. I never got to see him, Imagine. or even just say hello. You say so, so, so. Seeing that, even now, I'm getting goosebumps. Mm -hmm. at the remembrance of seeing the TARDIS and it's a, it is extraordinary but also you know people poo poo Doctor Who and even those who don't watch Doctor Who if you say Dalek they know exactly what you mean yeah. if you say TARDIS they know exactly the same. so whether they'll know Cybermen that's a different thing although mm -hmm. looking at me now I look as if I've turned into a Cybermen and <laughs> we might have a <clears throat> but, but, and I'm very proud to be associated with Doctor Who. It's mm -hmm. done a lot for me. Uh, I'm very grateful mm -hmm. to everybody involved with Doctor Who. I'm particularly grateful to Matt Smith because he was so kind and approachable and there was mm -hmm. no nonsense and we had a good laugh and I just pray there's an opportunity to work with him again. Mm -hmm. So maybe in order yeah, one day, maybe maybe in big finish one day. Who knows? Well, because um, people keep on asking if Dorian's coming back, and uh, mm. a year or so ago, I did a thing called the Eleventh Doctor Chronicles for Big Finish. Yes, and Jacob Dudman, absolutely excellent mimic, uh, does a superb Matt Smith, but he also does a superb David Tennant and a very mm. reasonable Peter Capaldi. So he's a very talented young chap indeed. But it would be lovely if it were to be with him face to face. But uh, who knows? Oh, wow. You know, just hearing that again, Matt Smith is my doc. So even hearing about him in such casual terms is kind of odd to yeah. me. <laughs> oh, but yes, working in the people I've interviewed previously and spoke with previously, I've never really had anyone who worked on the modern show. So just hearing about this quite. Interestingly, because they used to talk about, um, you know, they get their rehearsal time and they had very, very uh, snappy shooting days, you know, you know, in the classic series, it would be quite uh, tight and they wouldn't really have time um, to, to be in awe of it. It sounds to me like you actually had the time there to take it in and enjoy it. How, how is it for you in terms of being on a BBC production, you know? Well, I'm very lucky that over the years, the BBC have offered me work, you know, I, I would say the majority of my work has been with the BBC, mm. uh, television-wise. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, being asked to be in Doctor Who was something special. And, of course, the first thing I got, I didn't get to see the Doctor at all. He was just uh, the wonderful Alex Kingston as Doctor Sob. Yeah. It was just a remarkable. And it was very surreal. Uh, that's all I could say. Very surreal. So everything passed in a sort of as if I was dreaming it. Yeah. So it wasn't until I got back or got in last back to do a good man goes through war, war that I could actually really appreciate it more. That oh my god, I'm one of only a few actors now who's going to do two episodes, and in the end I did three, and then I did the prequel for a good man goes to war. And IMDb classes that as a separate episode. So as far yeah. as IMDb is concerned, I've done four episodes. Wow. And then, very bizarrely, there was a, what was it? Pointless. Yes. There's a, uh, the a game show. show. Pointless. Yeah. But yeah, game show. And one of the questions was, um, 
Can you name actors who've both both been both in Doctor Who and Harry Potter? And of course, I was one of the pointless ones because nobody could think of my name because nobody, no, nobody outside of sci-fi knows who the mm. hell I am. I was going to say, being an answer on pointless, I don't know if I'd be <laughs> if I'd be filled or if I'd be. I don't know, but it's certainly an interesting thing to say that you're an answer on pointless, isn't it? Well, well, and it's, it's very strange. And then the, I. Uh, on the um, well, on the TV guide, yeah. Uh, one time he looked up and it had Doctor Who starring Matt Smith uh, and Simon Fisherbecker. Ooh. That was I thought, oh wow, yeah, wow. So I took a quick photo of that. <laughs> that stays forever. That does. Wow. Yeah. But I've had a because of Doctor Who, I've been. I've had an opportunity to do lots of stuff, yeah. and uh, in, including working in America. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, very surreal time. I was um, I was in America. I was doing a convention in Rhode Island. Yeah, I see. Followed by a convention in Long Island. Uh, Anyway, whilst at Rhode Island, I got a call from my agent saying somebody wants to book you to do a pilot for an American. Uh, and I said, when? And the date was the, for the dates were the Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday after I did Long Island, which meant I had to stay on. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'm here, I might as well. But how do they know I could do it? Um, and uh, and the answer was they know me, and of course I had no idea who they were. Well, their names didn't mean anything at all. Anyway, long story short, it turned out the guy. It was a thing called an an an, uh, an accidental president. Ah, That's cool. Okay. And the character I was to play was a vice president. Okay. Uh, and the actor playing. Uh, the uh, vice president um, died. Oh my days! And filming was due. You know, mm. studios booked and venues booked and everything. And it turned out that somebody else was in the show was at the convention in Rhode Island. So they contacted him and says, "Do you know any other fat actors?" Blah, 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 blah. And he fortunately said. Well, actually, there's Simon Fisher Becker, and apparently the director is a big fan of Doctor Who, and he just put me there and then. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. Absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, uh, but uh, and of course, so they were very kind. They thought my my American accent was very good, but uh, it was. Uh, and since then, I have found, uh, I have found that um, if people know I'm in America, they'll they'll call my agent and ask if I can do something for them. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to. There was an actor's name. I've got to look him up. Okay. Uh, um, no, if I were you, I'd start booking holidays around America every year, just knowing you're going to get bits and pieces, you know? Well, it, 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 it's, it's amazing. Is That's how they get round their... Um, yes, the actor has died as well. That makes, makes it even worse. I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, he... Uh, where's the cast? Here we go. Cast and crew, here we go. Dun, 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 dun. I should know. Oh, he was another wonderful, very funny man. David Huddleston is his name, and he David. actually he actually played the Big Lebowski in the film called The Big really? Lebowski. Really, David Huddleston, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. He appreciated that I'd been called in at short notice, mm. and was very and was very understanding. But uh, what I also discovered in America. Uh, everybody are in awe of any English actor. Yeah, <laughs> and also in in America, it doesn't matter if you fluff your lines. Yes, I'll just go again. 
so so much over here in the UK. You're supposed to it, people tax tax if you pluck your lines too much. But uh, so so that's but that's an example of things that happen. Also, mm. I get invited because the Americans in particular love my voice. Mm. So I have been invited to go over just to give talks. Um, uh, and one engagement was, I, I said, well, what is it you'd like me to talk about? Oh, we don't care what you talk about. We just love your voice. <laughs> They're very blunt in America as well. They'll just say, well, we, don't, we don't know. Yeah, we'll don't, do it. don't care what you talk about. We just love your voice. Yeah. And then one of the most bizarre things, I was invited over. I, I was paid for a whole week right, mm. to go to Tulsa. Mm. And the actual job itself was a, just one afternoon. Really? Uh, and it, it was to open a vodka bar. <laughs> right? And as someone who's TT, that was somewhat ironic. Mm. But uh, it, it was a, uh, <laughs> it was extraordinary. That's all I'm wow. saying. Wow. Yeah, just, uh, but, uh, and so this gives the impression that I have a wonderful, glamorous lifestyle. And some people think I earn the same sort of money that Matt Smith does. I just say, I only wish. Uh, <laughs> we all wish that. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> but that can get me into aw awkward situations as well. Uh, because people think I now earn a lot of money, mm -hmm. I am... Uh, how can I put the, say this on air without upsetting something? I won't name any names, but I had two friends, and I'm saying had because they're no longer friends. Mm -hmm. But both of them independently asked me if I could pay their mortgage. And the first time it happened, I thought it was just a friend having difficulty paying, you know, one month's mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, they wanted me to pay it off. <laughs> and then a second one comes along and asks exactly the same thing. What? Uh, and, and I'm trying to explain to them, I haven't got that sort of money to pay off a whole yeah. mortgage. And, and there is part of me that just says, even if I did have the money, unless you were a really, really close friend, and I thought, you know, for example, if I did win, yeah. well, it's, it's 25 million pounds on the euro uh, <laughs> yeah. tonight. If I won that tonight, there are a few people I would pay off their mortgage if that's what they need to yeah. help them. But, but really, it was... Uh, that's such a bizarre... <laughs> But the thing is, they don't believe you. It's an yeah. example. Uh, they've come to conclusions about something. And as far as they're concerned, they're right. And so if I'm saying the opposite, that means I'm lying. Well, what, what, what it seems to me is there's, there's like a bracket. Because you've been involved in Doctor Who, you're in a certain bracket of celebrity. That's celebrity, right? Um, and then there's the bracket who make the big money. And then there's a bracket just below, but because you're associated with these people, it's assumed that you're on the same financial step on the ladder, I suppose. And I feel like that's probably the case for a lot of production members on the show, etc. It's it's a, it's what I mentioned before. You know, for what we do, we're paid mm. very well. But mm -hmm. uh, I I would still call myself a visiting artist because that's because I haven't quite got my mental state out of that bracket. Mm. Uh, and for, as I say, for what I do, I get a very, very handsome daily rate. Yeah. But, you know, even if a project lasts for a week or two weeks, if I get no other job for the rest of the year, then that's all I've earned for the year. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, uh, but some people don't seem to take that on board, and especially when they read in the Sun, <laughs> the Sun newspaper, of course, which is the font of all knowledge, uh, uh, is, um, you know, the, whatever yeah. the Sun quotes as somebody's fee, you have mm. to move, you have to move the dot to the left at least two or three times, I think. There you, are. Uh, you know exactly where I'm from, so you, you know my opinion on the Sun already, I'm sure, but... Yeah. Um, they, what they say about celebrities is ridiculous to me in in the you'll notice they never cite that they've spoken to the celebrity nor their agent nor you, you know their financial manager if they're lucky enough to have one yes yes the the, the, the difficulty is having something unsaid yes because uh, once they've said it you can't get the retraction or if you get the retraction it's hidden away somewhere. 
uh, and so the most people will think and people just make the, the <coughs> uh, uh, oh it reminds me I, I i told you at the beginning of this uh, i used to be in the civil service yeah uh, but then when i announced i was going to be an actor i went to my insurance company mm -hmm. uh, and i went into the office uh to say uh um, I'm going to be an actor then. Uh, they wouldn't, they said they don't cover actors. <laughs> what? I, I said, well, why not? And, and there's some excuse. Uh, and it's the way, her, it's the way this woman's face curled up. Mm. You know, I thought she was having a stroke. Mm. Uh, and, um, uh, in a, and at the time, when I first started out as an actor, I was also a, a freelance events organiser. Hmm. It's just the way she dismissively says, well, we all know you try and get second jobs. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was, uh, and that's when I discovered that actors are charged a humongous amount yeah. uh, for their car insurance, well above what the going rate was. At the time, we're talking now, so when I first decided to become an actor, would have been uh, around 1985. Right. As a civil servant, as a civil servant, my annual comprehensive car insurance was 60 pounds. Then the day after I've left the civil service and said I was going to be a, an actor, it went up to 600 pounds. I'm sorry. <laughs> and six, 600 pounds today is a lot of money, yeah. let alone in 1985. Uh, I mean, so that's that's where equity oh, came in. Yeah, that's where equity came in. No, we could help you, and they uh, they found an insurance broker called First Act. Yes. Uh, or they're actually they're actually they're actually um, uh, they're, they actually have a different name, but to performers they're known as First Act, and they do they cover. It's still more expensive as when I was in the civil service, yeah. but. Um, uh, and again, the that excuse, probably falls. Yeah, the excuse given is that if you are in an accident, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then somebody is more likely to go through with some civil yeah. action. Yeah. You. That's the excuse given. And I remember on one occasion, I was challenging this. And, uh, and the guy said, well, are you famous? He went like that. I said, well, the fact you've asked the question gives you the Tell, answer. Yeah, there you go. Oh. And as I say, even now, in sci-fi world, I'm, I'm reasonably well known. But outside of that, very few people, I think, know who I am. That, that's, that's it. But I'm sure they uh, use that for leverage now, right? They say, well, you're in Doctor Who. They'll find an excuse. They'll yeah. find an excuse. Um, there, was one, there was one year... Big, there's one year that they uh, the, the company I went with were okay because I wasn't in any sort of popular show. Mm. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm absolutely certain that had I been with them and had to make a claim when I appeared in Doctor Who, they would make that as an excuse not to pay out. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, these, these what I say, uh, other people say, oh, it's all too far-fetched, but I've, I've got grey hair. I'm 60 this year. I've lived through it all. Yeah, exactly. Lived through it all. Uh, uh, I lived through the era of the cheque is in the post. You know, there's people yeah. today who don't even know what a chequebook is. You know, but, well, now, uh, well, nowadays you get, um, I'll pay you an exposure instead of cheque is in the post, you know, you know, when you start out, right? Uh, it, 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 all, it all depends what you want to agree to. But at the end yeah. of the day, you've got to be able to pay for your shopping when you exactly. go down to the supermarket. You've got to pay for your, either your rent or your mortgage. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so it, it is, and it is very interesting that when it comes to cost cutting at productions, uh, you'll find the main uh, ones who are affected are the actors. 100%. Yeah, the actors. But there we go. Uh, <laughs> But it's not a proper job, was so why should you put why should you be upset? Anyone who hasn't really tried it properly, 
uh, d doesn't really understand because people just think there are people who think if I'm in a film for ten minutes, it, it only took me ten minutes to film. Yeah. Uh, that there are uh, uh, there are some people I've had conversations with that they disagree that we have royalties. I don't get royalties. I do my job, and that's it. I get paid for it. <laughs> and I said, yes, you get paid. A whole year's salary. I, I also, I, I also, very tongue in cheek, have another viewpoint of it. Mm. It's because I wasn't paid the going rates at the time, mm. so the royalties are really just uh, catch up. Exactly, exactly. But there's <laughs> many ways you can look at it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I would agree. It's my chosen profession. I had some understanding of what the issues would be. But it's not until you actually experience it that uh, yeah. uh, a friend of mine, he was a stuntman uh, and uh, he was uh, involved, he had a very serious accident on set. <laughs> and, uh, and what was very, very appalling was the production company before he left hospital had to remove, well, before the end of the day, had removed all his stuff from the hotel he was staying in. Really? Yeah, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, the star of the show, who I won't name, was very honourable and said, you know, if they didn't, uh, you know, seat this guy properly, he would no longer continue. Very so, good. But why does it need someone like that to there you go. say something like that? So the, those sort of thing, cost-cutting things are appalling. Alas, uh, the, the stuntman has died since he had oh my died. He died, died of cancer. But mm. um, but there is, and over the years, we've all, there are some of us, everybody, I think every, every person I've spoken to in the green room will tell you of a time that they never got paid. Yeah. Uh, or they were, they were told they were paid and they've just forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> that does how I've heard of that happening a lot in the yeah, geez. Uh, dear, oh dear, 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 yeah. Uh, or they've not paid the amount that was agreed to. Yeah, that's, and that that was another. One. It's not so. It's not so easy now. I must admit that with my agent, uh, when she tells me I've got I've been offered a job, she then tells me by forwarding all the emails that she's had. Yeah. From the production company, so I can see up front exactly what's going on. There we go. Um, That's so getting yeah, an agent but, obviously really, really does help that. But I uh, yeah. having an agent is very useful because some production companies won't deal won't deal with the talent is their phrase. Mm. Uh, um, but but also at least the agent can sort of talk and iron out yeah some issues which could be contentious. But in my case, though, I can't see what the contention would be. Uh, uh, I, uh, a lot of actors obviously go in to try and understand all that themselves, and people can govern themselves in that sense, obviously. But if, probably when you're starting out, you do need someone helping you helping you out, or you are going to get ripped off because you're not yes. going to know the rules. And, that, and that's that's where equity comes in. Yes, because they offer free legal advice. And if they feel you've got a case, they will follow it through for you. Um, but what I also recommend to any actor, particularly when starting out, if you can arrange with your agent that you could sit in the office or even try and work in the office for, say, eat a month, mm -hmm. right? you'll have a total, total understanding of how everything works. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, you hear lots of actors saying, "I don't know why my agent didn't put me up for X, Y, Z." Yeah. Well, uh, the reality is, uh, he or she probably did put you up, but the casting director didn't call you in. There we are. There we go. And uh, oh. and they they could they can phone and say, "Oh, why didn't you call in so and so?" Uh, but casting agents don't like that conversation. They'll just say you've sent in these who we've chosen. Uh, and also what I earned, learned is that uh, they have the first sort of, they're the first filter. They'll yeah. call in 50 people, <clears throat> but they only put 10 people forward. <clears throat> so I didn't know that until I worked in the office. So that was something I learned. 
So, because uh, I just assumed if you went for a casting, you know, the directors and producers saw you. But that's not always the case. Mm. Also, I can understand, you know, I can understand why some things are rushed mm. uh, because the casting directors often don't get the job in until quite late. They'll be contacted. In, you know, we want to cast somebody by for Wednesday. It, it's so, a thankless um, job, I can imagine. Yeah. It is a thing. And so things can be rushed. And when things are rushed, then sometimes the information that needs to be given to the actor isn't always accurate. Uh, and I remember on one occasion, I, I went to a casting. I need to be told I'd gone on the wrong day. Oh. No, you, you should have come in yesterday. Right? I said, no, no, no. Here we go. And fortunately, I printed off the email I got from Kim and, <clears throat> and it included all the correspondence from the casting director. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, here, this is, this is the date that you told my agent I should come in. Absolute no apology. Oh. But they did the casting and uh, uh, I didn't get the job because mm. I was a day too late. <laughs> didn't get the job. But there was no apology. They wouldn't uh, think to, would they? Because that would have meant uh, they're wrong, you know. And uh, and I know two or three actors who said they were upset because they were sent to the wrong casting agent. <sighs> and these things happen. Uh, yeah, they sh they shouldn't happen, but they do. Uh, uh, but uh, you know. But I now, I'm older and I've lived through it all. I just say it's part of the job. Mm. It shouldn't Trial happen. It. Yeah, it shouldn't happen, but it does happen. Of course. <clears throat> but then you see, uh, many years ago, we're talking about 1997, so this is okay. a long time ago. Uh, I went for a casting for a job that would take place in Norway. Okay. Uh, and I heard... Uh, heard nothing about it at all no I put myself forward for a job in Norway and <laughs> heard nothing and months and months and months went by uh, and my then agent showed up and said oh I've managed to get you a casting for a job in Norway and it went in my mind I thought oh I wonder if it's that one anyway when I went to them uh, I all I needed was a chat because they they had seen my application that I put in personally. Huh? They had checked my showreel and thought, yes, this is the one we want. But in between then and the time of me seeing them, there was a massive fire and they'd lost all their stuff. But somebody oh. just happened to put my name down in a notebook of theirs. And it took it took them a bit of time, but they searched and found me, and that's how they then found me by contacting my then agent, who then tells me that he found the job for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'd be having him by the scuff the next saying, "Excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, why should I be paying you any commission?" <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, so. Oh, hang on, I think somebody's at my door. Hang on. Okay, no. Oh, no, it's all right. Tony's gone. Right. Um, uh, yes. So, so there's all that that goes on, and you have to laugh. And mm. it was a brilliant job. Brilliant of job. Course. I had to play an eccentric Englishman called Jonathan Quick. Oh. Uh, and it and it was it was uh, really a, like a little tourist, mm. a little a travel show, uh, showing off. Uh, a number of places in the south part of Norway. Mm. Very good. But that was 1997. That was a long time ago now. Yeah. Still very, very, very good. But yeah. I'm just imagining that the idea of just a production just being okay a few months after something burning down. <laughs> well, it, it, it just goes to show that whatever I sent them and whatever they thought of my showreel, which they mm -hmm. must have seen, um, it did the trick for them yeah. that they actually went out the way to find me. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, yes. But uh, 
Yes. But I, I can tell you, and we sort of laugh at it now, but at the time there are certain things that have happened that uh, I remember having this conversation. I've been for an audition for something and um, this guy, for some reason, was very upset about the hyphen in my name. Excuse me? Uh, he said, you're not going to get very far with these double barreled names. Clearly chip on the shoulder, right? Mm. I said, oh, thank you. And I, I said to him, I'll have to discuss it with Helen Bonham Carter and Tim Pickett Smith. Uh. <laughs> and it, it, but it did irritate me. But, uh, mm. And I did, when I first joined Equity, I thought I would go in as Simon Fisher. Right? Mm. But there was already a Simon Fisher. Mm, that's generally right? the case, uh, isn't it? Yeah. And there was also a Simon Becker. And I said to Equity, so if I just stick to my 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 real name, Simon Fisher Becker with a hyphen, is that okay? And they said fine. And so that's really why I kept it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> and then I get variants of the, of the name all the time. Some people call me Becker Fisher uh, or Fish Beck. <laughs> That'd be a great uh, so social media handle. Fish Beck. <laughs> yes. Fish Beck. But uh, um, Ian McNeese. Mm. who played Winston Churchill in Doctor Who and of course is Bert Large in Doc Martin that's right both and I were both of us were uh, invited to a, a student function mm. uh, uh, and when we got there there were two massive posters and under my picture uh, there was Ian McNeese and under his picture, there was Simone Becker Fisher. Oh, Simone Becker Fisher. Now, Ian McNeese is the, the loveliest chap, and he finds that sort of thing very funny. He mm. had a mock conversation with them to say this is the done thing, you know, blah blah. blah. <laughs> and of course, they were they were falling on their swords, uh, and we were the only two guests. Yeah. So when he was being interviewed, I sat in the audience, and when I was being interviewed. Uh, um, he sat in the orders mm. and then he kept on saying now tell me Simone <laughs> <laughs> so he is a lovely gentleman, he's the funniest man I know, he's got a very dry sense of humour mm. uh, and we've had many, many a journey, he used to drive uh, drive with me mm. to events and uh, just so, so funny uh, but uh, there we go um Right. Now, we've been two hours. Incredible. Is, is, that, is that okay for you? I think that's absolutely perfect. I was about, I was about to say, as much as we can NASA for days, because I, I feel like you and I have that going on at the minute, we're absolute. I've really enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed hearing about the, act, the, the acting side of the industry. I'm usually hearing from directors and writers and that sort of thing, but hearing from an actor has been wonderful. Yeah. But also hearing about modern yeah. Doctor Who's production because I've never actually had anyone on before from the modern series. Uh, well, my experience was wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm often asked what it's like. It is once you get in, in, in it's like a big family. Yeah. Uh, they expect you to know what you're doing, mm. and they booked you with the assumption that you know what you're doing. Of course. Uh, and that, uh, that's also it. But it is, a, and because there's this friendly atmosphere, it is a very enjoyable experience. There is the inner tension. Mm, you don't course. want to mess this up. You don't want to mess this up. And of course, I got to work with the wonderful Francis Barber as well. Yes. Oh, God, I was so scared. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I just respect these people. Yes, of course. Uh, but there we go. So yes, on that note, um, but obviously all the things that you've promoted will be in the description below. I hope that everybody right. who's watching checks some out because you've been working hard, clearly getting all these these things done. Yeah. So you just absolutely deserve the traction. Please go and check it out, guys. Well, that's okay. And um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, it, it's been one of the better interviews I've had because we've had a we've had a chat. Absolutely, I feel like that's how it should be, but you're not here via mandate you know you know my channel likes to make people feel like they want to talk about their lives they want to talk about things we're doing you're not here because a contract is signed you know type thing no, but but what what better 
opportunity for an actor but to talk to about themselves for two hours <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <But> yes. <laughs> yeah thank you so but, much and have a wonderful day son thank you okay. thank you